Uh, for those of you new, I'm Michael McFall. I'm the director here at FSI and uh, do some other things. I have three big questions. One is about diagnostics, another is about norms, and a third is about prescriptions that I'm hoping each of you will take a whack at. Uh, and so you can do the math. We have about an hour and 15 minutes and we want to leave 30 minutes for questions so that can, you can now calibrate uh, the way we should respond here, okay? Before we do, let me just briefly introduce our panelists. You have their full bios already handed out, but we really do have a terrific panel here. Uh, professor, uh, professor, President, distinguished fellow, colleague of ours here at Stanford and Hoover, uh, President Ildis is with us again. He already spoke. Um, uh, he, was, uh, he did basically every job you can do in the Estonian government worth doing except one, I think, which is prime minister. Is that fair to say? Uh, his last job in the government was for 10 years, uh, president of Estonia. And uh, any of you who know anything about him know that uh, when it comes to democracy, uh, security, and the cyber world, there is nobody thinking more about these issues than, than Tomas. That's why he, we're glad that he's our colleague here. Uh, next to him is Nicole Wong, who's an attorney specializing in the internet, media, intellectual property law. Uh, she also served in the government uh, with you, Dennis, right? You guys overlapped as Deputy Chief Technological Officer at the White House. But she's also worked in the private sector perfectly to Twitter, Google, uh, and therefore in this intersection is the perfect panelist to have with us today uh, because we're going to talk about those intersections in this panel. Next to her is Michael Brown, who right now is a White House Presidential, Presidential Innovation Fellow over at DUIX. D-I-U-X, I'm dyslexic, so I apologize. Um, that's the Defense Innovation Unit Experimentation down in Mountain View. Um, uh, I'll let him t talk in a minute about what research he was doing there, but he also uh, knows a little bit about the private sector as the former CEO of Symantec. Uh, and finally, uh, Dennis McDonough is with us today. Uh, Dennis, actually Dennis spent eight years at the White House. Uh, I think there's only, Four people have done that. Two of them. One was named the president. The other was the vice president. <laughs> um, uh, I overlapped with him for the first three years there, um, and then his last job was uh, chief of staff at the White House. And just because there are there's some government people in the room, but there's some people who have never served in government. Uh, these are really, really hard jobs that are incredibly demanding. Dennis had gray hair before he joined the government, I think. Uh, but eight years at the White House doing the jobs he did, in including Deputy National Security Advisor, is really just tremendous service to our country. So thanks for being here today, but also thanks for your service, Dennis. Okay, first diagnostics. Like the last panel, uh, the, the idea that foreign governments, including our own, but I think and then whenever I say including my own, I have to keep reminding myself I'm sitting next to the, the former president of Estonia. Um, so for, forgive my American-centric way of speaking, Tomas. But um, uh, governments have always used information as a tool of, of, of their foreign policy objectives. Uh, like the panel this morning, what's new, of course, is we have new technologies and all the things we talked about this morning that can help them or prevent others from defending themselves. So before we get into norms and prescriptions, and anybody can go at any point, we're gonna be, we're gonna be loose here, okay? Uh, Mike and I exchanged emails. I said, we're gonna be loose, and he, he said, yes. Um, help us give your take on the scope of the problem and, and your diagnostics, right? Uh, I'm thinking about the Facebook thing and the Russia buy. Uh, I'm, I'm quite concerned with that. I've written about that. And, but other people say, hey, compared to what goes on on Facebook, how big a, big a deal is this really? Uh, the Chinese, yeah, they're poking around. But are, do, are they really violating our sovereignty in a way that we should care? Uh, and about two weeks ago on Twitter, uh, I got into a huge debate with several Russian journalists and American journalists based in Moscow. Obviously, Russia is the case I know best, but I'm quite interested in the Chinese and the uh, Iranians and ISIS as well. Uh, they said, well, this is just the price we pay to be a free society. And if you guys start messing around with trying to do anything to enhance American sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis these states, we're going to face retribution in terms of closing the space, including for them personally uh, in Moscow. So 
what, how do you think of the scope of the problem? How big is it? How different is it? Um, Tomas, maybe we'll start with you, and then people jump in as you see fit. Well, I, or you don't have to jump in. You're <laughs> going to play it loose. Well, I, I see this as a really a broad spectrum at attack <clears throat> in all kinds of levels, and we don't. I'm not going to get into Garasimov, but basically, or the, but I would just simply say that <clears throat> whatever works will be used. Uh, you know, if invading Crimea works, it'll be used. If uh, if you spoof uh, your GPS coordinates on a U.S. ship, that will do that. If you're going to, as we found out this summer, or if you, uh, fa as we found out recently, if you, if you want to uh, uh, get U.S. troops or other troops in NATO uh, that you want to sort of, s sort of get worked up, you'll do it electronically. And then if you move into the social sphere, and, and this is, I guess why I mentioned this, is I don't think we should like focus on one thing and then not realize that it's part of a broader approach. I mean, then you have all, um, all various things you can do. Uh, as I mentioned. Don't talk about what we can do. No, Scope the, of the no problem they, first. they can do. They can do. Thank you. And yeah, yeah. in Great. the morning, uh, I mentioned here, yeah, I mean, okay, we, fo we have focused on fake news as a concept for a long time. Uh, but actually, if you look at this, there are a whole series of vectors that can be used. I mean, there was doxing, which was what was done to uh, Secretary Clinton, that is publishing yes. stolen mails. You then have the mechanisms of Twitter bots to amplify fake news in ways that uh, have not been done before. And here I would say, I don't, I'm going to say quickly, I don't understand why these are not approached since you have your own alumna uh, in the University of Washington, Kate Starbird, who has done extensive research on bots when yes. she discovered they were completely distorting uh, distorting a picture of various events. And by the way, speaking in a CBDRL seminar in about 10 days or two weeks' time, so come to that talk. And she also was the most valuable player in the uh, uh, MVP two years. Uh, two years in a row playing basketball for Stanford uh, and then had a very distinguished career beyond that. But Tomas only knows her because of what she does on bots. Right. But, but, uh, you also, but you also <laughs> have, you know, uh, the DRL lab uh, with Ben Nimmo tracking bots. And you will now have this new group that we're both a part of, I guess, which is, is doing Hamilton 68 following bots. Uh, yet I don't know why bots continue to be on Twitter. It seems like a technical problem. Uh, and then you move on to... What was done, and we don't know yet, about with big data analyses and how uh, how they were, uh, how you picked out certain people or how algorithms picked out certain people in certain key states to be bombarded with messages uh, by the Russians. Uh, so Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, we now know, got uh, were attacked. Were I mean rather, they, those states had certain Facebook ads targeted. that were designed to change the voting pattern uh, and on a massive scale. And, the, and let's keep in mind, in those states, the, the difference in the votes were fairly minor compared to the number of ads. We don't, what we don't know, and I'll finish with that, is that we have no studies, and I don't even know how possible it is, of what, what has been the effect of at least these last three things that I mentioned. I mean, do they make a difference? Certainly, uh, we do know that people tend to believe things they see more of. That's the democracy of ideas. That's the marketplace. But if you see, you know, trending on Twitter, something that's utterly false because it's been magnified by hundreds of bots, tweeting every five seconds in some cases, well, then people begin to think, oh, I mean, this must be true because everyone is publishing this. Uh, and so we really have to, I would say, think hard about what is being done, figure out what's being done, and then begin to approach these things. Though I would say things such as eliminating Twitter bots is something we could, I don't see why it's not done now. So it sounds like you think it's a pretty big problem, right? <laughs> uh, if, you, if it's a glass, like we have to focus versus not, you're on the side, it's a problem. Nicole. So, so let me take a shot at this, and, and it's going to sound like I'm not answering your question, but I, I, I promise okay. I'm going to get back to it. Which Just is... because I answer the question <laughs> doesn't mean you have to answer it. I learned that a long time ago. Well, because I, I don't want us to lose sight of um, 
what I think is the primary, and this is the, sort of the focus of, of, of the conference, right, which is what are the democratic challenges that are brought to bear in this technological world? And, and I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that tens of millions of American citizens in our country voted for a candidate who was explicitly racist, misogynist, anti-Semitic, and gender intolerant, and didn't think those traits were disqualifying. And, and the group of those people exist in those fringe channels of 4chan and 8chan, and they drum up these ideas that are anti-globalist, anti-immigrant, ent entirely hateful. And, and the effect then is to take it out of those dark areas, to amplify <coughs> it in hyper-partisan media like Breitbart and, and other places, or in Sputnik. Um, and then that catalyzes a, a thing where, where, where then we have the social networks come into play, right? Where the social networks start to, to make it go viral, where the bots start to come into play, where ad systems start to boost it, and all of a sudden now it's a mainstream discussion. To me, that is the, the key of the problem. The technological part is a part of it, but, but I don't want us to lose sight of. There's a part of our country that buys this, and if we don't address that, we are sunk. <laughs> um, so that's, a, that's my diagnostic. Great. Mike. Yeah, just continuing on, I think uh, it's ironic that we're here in Silicon Valley talking about this because I think as these technologies emerged, uh, they were thought of as a force for good that would help democracy, that we'd be able to spread the good ideas and, uh, and become more enlightened. And really now what we're seeing as the dark side, they can be used for very subversive purposes. And I think as a tool, uh, the internet gives you incredible reach, um, which we just talked about. You can tailor the message, and then you can obfuscate who's sending the message. So for governments that are especially uh, totalitarian, authoritarian, uh, they view this as the supreme propaganda tool, and they're using it against our own citizens. So I think it's a huge problem and challenge for democracy. Dennis. Mike, I think it's a major problem. So on size of the problem, it's big. Uh, and if you define the problem, I think, as I define the problem, uh, sitting, you know, we, we used to work in a building where you, you know, many of us in this room, you swear an oath to preserve and protect the Constitution of the United States. And it's my belief that foreign intelligence agencies wanted to influence the fundamental democratic activities of the United States. So I think it's a big problem, uh, point one. Point two is, I think Nicole is onto something because the context is extraordinarily important. And the context is not only uh, the votes that Nicole talked about, but a uh, democracy that is deeply uh, divided along uh, deeply partisan lines, a uh, level of distrust in the governing institutions of the country uh, that feeds uh, a willingness to search out alternative sources of information, and then a distrust in, you know, the fourth, uh, the fourth estate, uh, in terms of the media. So, diagnostically, it's a big problem. Also, it's not. Uh, I, I'm not saying that President Elvis said it was solely a technical question. He's saying that about the bots. But if we do continue to debate the question just as about what can uh, or was done on Facebook or on Twitter, and don't begin to return to some concerted effort toward civil discourse, uh, then we are presenting a very fertile ground onto which uh, many foreign adversaries of the United States can seek to plant uh, divisive uh, and destructive information. I would say that that's always been a problem. It's just the technological means now are far greater and with far fewer resources, you can do things. I mean, there was, I mean, again, to contrast with. Um, Has it always been a problem? Yeah, sure I, did, I, would, I, would, I would rebut that. I, well, no, I'll give you an example. The, the, the story that, the, that CIA created AIDS was planted in a communist newspaper in, a, in the state of India, and then it made its way over six months into the European mainstream media, but there it kind of died because it looked ridiculous. Uh, and I mean, so it didn't really have an effect. Whereas today, if you were to you come up with you come up with these lies, 
uh, and magnified by bots within a day, it is, it is a trending story. And that could not happen. I mean, you didn't have the, uh, that, those mechanisms in, uh, back in the 1980s or the 1990s. Well, it's a trending story, uh, but the ability to rebut the story with influential voices now is undercut by the fact that there's deep distrust mm. in science, in independent media, and in the government. So you're right about the, uh, you're absolutely right about the story on AIDS. There's also, you know, it's been commented about publicly, there's an effort to try to characterize uh, President Reagan in 1984 uh, as um, psychologically deficient, which ended up getting reported in a newspaper too. But nobody believed it. And there at the time, you know, I, I tell this story all the time. When I first became chief of staff, I called all the existing chiefs of staff, living chiefs of staff. They all and take your call? They take your call. Okay, good. Uh, it's interesting, right? They take your call, don't leak, give you interesting, useful counsel. Uh, it's a very helpful group. Jim Baker said the most important thing was the calls he made at the end of every day to the network news anchors. <laughs> right? I, I thought that was interesting too. That's how it too. worked, huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's how it used to work. The problem was they used to call a lid in the White House at 3.30 every afternoon to say, we're done making news today, people, because everybody's going out to their editors for the nightly news and for the newspapers tomorrow. It's quaint. <laughs> That's a great story, yeah. Uh, there are not the gatekeepers of information that would have allowed you to right. construct a, uh, an aggressive counter push as against an information uh, campaign uh, like the one you talk about. Because right now, there is a group of people who would not believe it no matter where you pushed it. Yeah, I, I think the gatekeepers thing is, is critical, right? Which um, feeds, is fed by the technology. Uh, but, and I say this as a First Amendment lawyer who used to represent a bunch of the media, the media totally has let us down. In part because they aren't functioning as the gatekeepers on fake news in a lot of ways. Instead, they're chasing that shiny ball of sensationalism and novelty um, and, and the things that will feed a 24-hour news cycle uh, which just serves to amplify it. And so that combined with like some of the really hateful things that are being said out there has broadened in, in technical terms, right? Broadened our attack surface. Right. Um, so this is a great point. I'm glad we brought context in uh, because it should be in the back of all of our minds. I'm looking at Nate here. I mean, we have a lot of research, people working on polarization in American society uh, here at Stanford and other meetings. So let's keep that going, but I want to focus now on the normative, like whose problem is this, specifically with respect to foreign governments? Because remember, this morning we already talked broadly about this issue, right? Our panel, we're supposed to focus, because that was my writ from the ambassador, uh, to focus on the foreign, the, the weaponization of information. And I want to ask two different kinds of normative questions, and Mike, I'm going to start with you, okay? Uh, and then we'll bounce around. They're, they're, they're related, but not exactly the same, but I think to put them in different buckets of cybersecurity versus democracy is wrong. So the first is, who should be responsible for the fight against foreign information activities? Is it the companies? Is it the government? Is it civil society? Is it independent media? Who is the agent? And, and, and then what are they supposed to do? Uh, are they supposed to censor? Let me be provocative of the whole list. Are they supposed to, as we talked about very kindly uh, this morning, just ID? that this is, Sputnik is a foreign news agency and my mother in Montana should be able to know that. Is that something we should do? Uh, uh, there's data that shows that people don't know that RT, for instance, is a foreign agency. They don't know who owns it. They don't know where it comes from. It, and they're, by the way, I know RT extremely well. I've, I've known them from uh, the creation of that company. They very deliberately don't want you to know. That's why they just hired Jesse Ventura. Uh, you know, they want to blur that line between domestic and foreign. So is, it, uh, is that part of what should be done? And then who does it, right? Uh, sorry for the multi-pronged question here. Take whatever you want. But is that the government that does that? And we make them uh, register as agents, which is one modality that's being done. Or is that back to the eye on, on Facebook and that they should do it? Um, what about paid political ads? 
Should that be allowed? Uh, we don't let, uh, Putin can't give money to candidates. Uh, why can he buy ads, po uh, po paid political ads? Uh, and then who is the proper, if you think that that's true, as these are normative questions. Uh, if that's true, then whose job is it to police that? And I'm reminded of the debate we just had about the Facebook law in Germany in terms of the responsibility. But the second one, I want to pivot on the security side, because you've already brought up doxing and you brought up Clinton, but you didn't bring up Podesta. Well, let's focus on Podesta. Dennis knows uh, he worked for you. Uh, so let's talk about John and his fate a little bit. Um, yeah, I want to. Um, his risotto is awesome. <laughs> risotto is awesome. But, but, but here's the, the dilemma I think about. And by the way, I'm a heavily attacked person, as you might imagine. I get a lot of messages from Stanford and Gmail uh, about foreign governments. And, and we're pretty good here at Stanford, by the way. So I get probably better data than most people. Uh, it's constantly scary to think about, you know, someday they're going to break in. I've deleted all my risotto uh, recipes to make sure. Actually, I don't know if I made sure, because I don't really know how the technology works. But here's the thing. You know, if the Chinese, you know, r roll in across the border uh, up in Canada, we expect our government to respond to that, right? If somebody breaks into my house here on campus, I call the government, 911. I call the government, because my property has been stolen, or even my property has been attempted to be stolen, right? The alarm goes off, I call the government. When I get a notification that the Russians, we think it's the, we know it's the Russians in my case, that they're trying to steal my data, I call the IT guy. Right? I call, in my case, a really good one. Why is that? What's the normative argument that John Podesta, I've been in many meetings with a lot of tech people. Uh, there's this word hygiene that gets thrown around a lot, right? Uh, well, he didn't practice good cyber hygiene, as if, you know, we're, the, the, the one that is attacked is stinky, right? To, to stretch the metaphor. Why is it? Why is that not the government's respons responsibility? Or why is it not the company's responsibility? You sell me a car that I can't lock properly? What, that's my fault? Whose responsibility is it? So both on the policing side of the information attacks, who should do it, and on the security side, who should do it? Mike. So I think uh, this question calls for a little more context. So I think we're talking today about controlling the narrative. Um, and if you're thinking about what the strategies are, if you're Vladimir Putin or if you're uh, General Secretary uh, Xi Jinping, this is part of an arsenal that's at your fingertips. So the, the controlling the narrative is just one piece of that. It's also, what am I doing with my economic policy, especially in the case of China? Well, I got mercantilism and I've got industrial policy and I've got stealing a tech. I've got all that. I've got the military under my control. I got all the companies under my control. So. I think as we think about a response in the US, we got to think that these are uh, maybe not efficiently, but well-coordinated strategies, long-term strategic thinking by folks who are adversaries. So when you think about it in that context, to me, the answer is very clear. It has to be the government. No single company would have the resources to fight back. I mean, in the case of China, they have a quarter million members of their army who are focused every day on what they can steal from this country. Some are secrets that are uh, you know, uh, important for national security. Some are just plain old intellectual property, drawings, uh, information that then their government gives to companies who are going to compete with that stolen IP and hopefully put us out of business, uh, give that to Huawei and help to put Cisco out of business. So when you think that the scope of the problem is that broad, there's no question it has to be the government to respond. Now, Speaking as a former CEO of a cybersecurity company, there is something to the cyber hygiene. Yes. Uh, we have to practice uh, the best uh, practices that we know to be able to stop the easy attacks. But that's com going to be completely insufficient if I'm trying to defend myself against the Chinese army. Does and always remind thing? yourself their technological innovation is increasing. Like when everybody, oh, yeah, that's so stupid. You didn't have dual authentication. Yeah. Well, the, the technology on the adversarial side, of course, is changing at a rapid pace. Sorry. I, I just wanted to clarify. So, so when you say, is it, is it the government's job to be the responder, or is it the government's job to control the networks? Like, what, where, what, do you, what is the, because there's many places that the government could play a role, right? But well, what, if, what do you think well, it is? Clearly, uh, one of the questions that uh, Michael posed was about the response. 
it's illegal, of course, for any company to uh, hack back and respond, even though I understand there's some legislation that's been introduced about that right. recently. That's a little bit scary because that's anarchy. As you're assuming that a company would be able to do the right forensics to know who did the attacking and the smart attackers obfuscate that as, as much as possible. So that's a very scary scenario. So to the extent you're talking about attacking back, and I think a huge question is what are the right cyber deterrents? We haven't really addressed, we haven't grappled with that to the point where we've got good answers. Um, so that's my next question. When, when you so get you know. to the, uh, that part, it's got to be the government. But I also think that the government can play a role in helping the private sector and academia defend itself as well. So other countries are taking some steps, smaller countries, to do more of a uh, national protection. And I think we ought to be thinking about those ideas because uh, it, you get a very hodgepodge answer when you give it to uh, millions of companies. At least make some things available, not that we necessarily need to regulate that. Nicole, did you want to get in or skip I, to the I, president? I'm, I'm still mulling it over. I, I guess I'm trying to figure out, um, and this is sort of in deference to my colleagues who are on global platforms around the world, right? Which is, which, who's controlling what and how do you decide which country? Because so Google, Facebook, Amazon, whatever, they're, they're headquartered here. They are global platforms. So do, are they supposed to secure the network with the U.S. government here in the United States? but differently in Germany or Estonia, or, right, with, with those governments, it, it just strikes me as the physics of the internet don't quite work right for that. Um, so as I'm, and again, I'm trying to think both from a policy standpoint, how would we make that happen? Um, I know Brad Smith at Microsoft has sort of posed yep. this digital Geneva Convention as, right. as a possible solution, but I, I think there's gaps there in terms of like the actual, how the actual pipes connect to each other. Um, and the policies that we need around well, that. Well, for instance, you could have uh, regulation or law that would require certain hygiene. So you could have, I mean, just abstractly, you should say, if you work for the US government, you're not allowed to make a, a, a phone call. You have to use WhatsApp, just as a for instance, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, whether that's good or not, I, I just briefed a, a, a group of, uh, I shouldn't say this, uh, I should be careful here to not violate their privacy, uh, a, a big group of, of, of government officials, right? And I asked how many uh, do basic hygiene, and you know, it was really striking, given all the stuff that we focus on, the vast majority of the people in the room don't do basic stuff on email and don't do basic stuff on their phone. So that's one example where that could be a government solution, but with all the problems of, you know, your privacy and your your individual rights that would come with that. Tomas, sorry, and then I Dennis, we'll that, come to you. I mean, I, w I wouldn't say it's another case of American exceptionalism, but the degree to which the government does not provide a po play a positive role in the United States is astounding. The 145 million financial records, I mean, people's financial records that were stolen. Um, <clears throat> this year, but we found out about three weeks ago with Equifax. I mean, that is just unfathomable that no, there was no regulation whatsoever of how a private company stores the most important data of, you know, basically, you know, half the population. Uh, and then again, and it was moreover held in clear text, unencrypted. The only thing that makes that's worse is that the records of 23 million federal employees, including you, and from my days as a forest firefighter, I guess me too, because um, I worked with the federal government, that 23 million records of U.S. employees were hacked, and they were kept by the U.S. government, and they were kept in clear text. So, I mean, the government is not even doing itself what it should be doing. But and you think they can, right? I mean, absolutely. Estonians were just, just voted today, by the way. Well, we're voting this week. It's kind well, of Well, some have already voted. I've I seen did, on Twitter, yeah. you voted. And, you're, and we've had other debates here. You're very confident that those votes are gonna be secure and we don't have to worry about it. I th I've heard you argue, actually, I think, with Larry Diamond before on this. Well, so I mean, it basically, it I mean, in your interactions with the government, we, uh, you use a, uh, Okay. I mean, we have, uh, you have to use two-factor authentication. It's encrypted at uh, RSA 2048, and we're going over to elliptical for those geeks in the crowd here. Uh, but it is highly secure, and we have a distributed data exchange layer, so there is no central database uh, that you can hack into to get all this stuff. And the, all the worst you can possibly do is if you manage to hack one person, 
you can only get into one part of that person's data. It's the architecture. I mean, there are technological solutions, but they're technological solutions that can be provided by the government. Uh, you, theoretically, a company could do that, but, um, uh, well, I don't see anyone doing that. Uh, so I think there's a way of doing I mean, the technical side of this in the U.S. does not, as you said, really offer its citizens any protections the way it does with you know, truth and labeling, and you find out that if you drink a can of Coke, you get that many calories, right? There is none of that in the realm of cyber. I think you will be moving in that direction eventually, or be, at least before whatever what used to be called the big one was regarding nuclear war. I think now we're thinking in terms of cyber. Until there's something so awful, I mean, be it an entire electrical system or something, when in fact... They have this uh, presidential election that would seem pretty big. Well, we're going to get to Dennis on that Well, next, all I'm saying right? is that it is, that it, it's not, and it's not, a, it's not uh, like a slippery slope to Big Brother. It is really has to do with guaranteeing the, uh, the safety of your citizens' communications. Right. Yeah. In I'm your sorry. case of being hit by, you know, Russians trying to get into your account, uh, then you would have recourse to an authority say, you know, this is happening and they would probably take it under, sort of start okay. looking at it. So I'm going to pivot to your concrete ideas of what is to be done, both on offense and defense, because I want to talk about the offensive piece. But Dennis, Can I you, say one you live, no, no, of course, you lived this in 2016. Well, so Tell I, us your views. So. Well, it, it, interestingly, um, so I, one of the things I do now is I teach at Notre Dame. I taught uh, a case study this week on the Sony hack of North Korea. There's a remarkable fortune three-part uh, review of what happened in that uh, case. And up front in part one is a little bit of a, like a, like if I were, you know, grading this, I'd give them like a D minus of a disclaimer about why they use the information they use for the story they write. And the stories are very chatty about, you know, what's in the emails among the Sony leadership at the time. You remember those, right? Yes, of course. Because they're all in the newspaper. Some of the most private conversations among people in the Sony leadership, which ex post facto, then Fortune goes ahead and writes a story about basically leading the, the entire three-part three story with a lot of the chattiness from those emails. But the disclaimer about why they use the information from the hack, yeah. um, which was then made available on public file sharing sites, um, was an awareness raising exercise. Uh, which as I say, I thought that was not oh, super compelling uh, because you could surely do an awareness raising exercise without having to share out uh, personal information being exchanged among employees. Uh, which is a long way of answering your first question, which is, normatively, I am surprised there's not a more robust discussion among journalists about the use of information gotten uh, from hacks. And um, I, I'm not sure I know what the right answer is. Uh, I guess I give props to the reporter in the Fortune piece for having acknowledged it as an issue. Um, but there wasn't much acknowledgement of that in reporting last year. I, th I think this is actually a crucial difference uh, that is where society and journalism has gone through. I mean, if you think in 1972, the Watergate break-in, had it been successful, no newspaper would have published the private correspondence of the DNC. In 2016, newspapers went hog wild with the publishing the private correspondence of people taken from the DNC. And I think it's part of a larger issue that if it's on paper, if it is physical, we think it's one thing. But in our minds, we think, oh, well, that's just, you know, that's just digital. Uh, but the, co I mean, our content is now digital. That, but, yeah. but, it's, but we seem to think that it's okay to, to publish someone's private emails, but we don't think it's okay to you know, to publish a purloined letter, as in the Edgar Allan Poe story, because that's physical. And the only difference is that once, I mean, we, we think that they're different things, but they're not. Well, and so we've I think also this cuts both go, go ways. Yeah, go, please. Right? So, so that's my first question. I think normatively, I think that we have to figure that out. Second is, 
call this hygiene or call it hard lessons learned. And I'm mindful that you know uh, we're we're all um, at risk of being hacked. So um, mindful of how much information is spilled out there, and mindful that the norms in this space are still being developed. Um, I think we ought to not only practice hygiene, but also be very careful in what we write. Um, and or say on the telephone. Yeah, this this is you know they they used we used to have the Washington Post test, which is if you're not comfortable with it appearing on the cover of the Washington Post tomorrow, don't write it. Um, now again, I, I you know I'm, I'm mindful that I could be hacked any day, and you know I've seen God some of your this. emails, man. <laughs> you don't want them on the watch. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so that's the second normative thing, which is. What about the individual? And we can talk right. about more about that when we get to what yeah. we should do about it. But I think some heightened degree of scrutiny. Uh, by the way, I think this is kind of a generational thing. This is not going to be an issue with my kids, right? Either sourcing or what they push around. My, are, you know, I, I get the sense that they're they are much more careful and much more discerning about what comes over. Uh, their channels. That's the second thing. Third thing is, to, to President Ilvis's point, this question about understanding uh, digits and what they mean, I think goes directly to your question about enforcement. And w we need to get to the bottom of exactly how we do treat this information, given that it's digital. and. Um, I think that then I think there's a difference between before the hack and after the hack. I think uh, this question about who provides security across the domain is different before and after. And enforcing some norms after the fact um, and enforce, enforcing some punishments after the fact is going to have to be something that gets tested because it it inevitably brings, it brings in questions of speech, uh, as against questions of personal privacy, exactly. um, as against ultimate questions of transparency. Right. When you're in the government, every email you write, unless it's classified, will be public within 10 to 12 years. If it's classified, it's a longer tail. That's an understanding that you have pursuant to the Presidential Records Act and the Federal Records Act, which are direct statutory reactions to Watergate. That transparency is a good thing at the end of the day. It's antiseptic. Should the same be applied to public officials on their private accounts? That's, and should it be applied to public officials on their private accounts when they weren't public officials? I think these are not trivial questions to resolve, which brings me back to the first, or first, business, first bit of business, which is mindful that the norms are so fluid, mindful that uh, the attack's surface is so broad, we'd all be well advised to chill out a little bit on what you write in email. So let me take one more swing at the normative peak. We spoke mostly about uh, securing information, which was, but I, I asked a two-part question, so that was my fault. Let's take one more swing with the panel about who is responsible normatively, and then we're going to get prescriptions to my last question, about identifying uh, when governments are using information inside America or inside Estonia, who is responsible for um, Let's just, let's just stick with identification now. We'll talk about uh, offense, defense in a minute. Is that the, the job of the government? And if it is, should it be banned? Should it be regulated? Should political ads be banned, but everything else be OK? Um, and, or is it part of the, the platform? Is this a, an assignment for the platforms? So are you talking about the gov use uh, by the government like uh, I'm talking about of RT personal ad, management? So RT bought ads on Facebook, right? right. We all know that. Sh is that right? Should that be allowed or not? And if well, it shouldn't be allowed, who should stop it? Well, I mean, in the case of Facebook, as at least from what I have read, the Federal Election Commission 
told them they should or need to, in the case of political ads, this is before the whole Russia thing, say who paid for them, and they chose to ignore that. Um, this is not good. I mean, I mean, you think that ads are ads, and that it should be irrespective of the media that should a foreign government. Let me be more that's precise. before getting to the foreign government. I, I want to get to the foreign and then part. you get that's, to the that's my assignment. and then you have to get the foreign government <laughs> yeah. part, which says that foreign governments may not buy ads and participate in a in a domestic. It's a, most Western liberal democracies say foreign governments don't have a place in the electoral process. So, well, that's, I don't think that's true in America. I've had this argument a hundred times. When Sputnik tweets, hashtag Crooked Hillary, that wasn't censored. Nobody had a problem with that. They're just, they're part of the media. But, but, so, but I think, I think we it's are an exceptional to, country. But to like, uh, be, like, be nuanced about the type of content we're talking about because there, there's a difference between ads or promoted sponsored links or whatever they are and not ads, right? So, and, and, and I think in this last election, my sense of it, and the Facebook and YouTube people know better than I do, um, that my sense of it is that actually what was driving a lot of it were not necessarily ads. It was just opinion or commentary that went viral for its own reasons. So, so I think, and, and, maybe, and I think you regulate stuff. accelerated some, through the use of money. Let's absolutely, be clear about that. absolutely. So, okay. but, I, but I think it's really important to keep those two distinct because I think that the solution set is different between what you can do with something that you know is advertising and being paid for and has a political tone or, or, or consequence to it and that which does not present as advertisement. So let me be really specific. Uh, and then there's lots of hundreds of other cases, right? Sputnik is owned by and controlled by the Russian government, by Putin. He is an adversary, in my opinion. So that's, on, that's the opinion part. The other part, that's all known. I, I know, the guy who set it up, he's a personal <laughs> friend of mine. Uh, he's a good guy, actually. Um, he no longer works for them. When they tweet, <laughs> maybe there's a causation there. When, when that entity uses an American company uh, represent, you know, Nick, I'll come back to you, as I always do, uh, to tweet hashtag crooked Hillary during a presidential election campaign, should normatively, should that be allowed or not? And then who, who's responsible, depending on where you come out? Or is it just media? Is it just we got to live with it because we're a free society? That, that's the question. Oh, but Mike? So on the ad part, it's not clear they're ads. They were bought as ads. People did not see them as ads. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big difference. That's true, too. That's the obfuscation part. Yeah. You, you don't see what's propaganda. And I think back to uh, whether it's talking about Russia or certainly China, yeah. those are instruments of the state. So if we think it's okay to have Vladimir Putin weigh in with obfuscated propaganda uh, in our media, um, I think we ought to have our heads examined. I, I think that's clearly wrong. Now you get to, well, what do you do to fix that? I have fewer ideas on that. I don't know whether that's the government's role, whether the platforms themselves, but to me that's wrong. I yeah. just try to think of like what the rules would be. I'm sorry, but like what, what the rules would be around that of like only media that comes out of authoritarian countries get classified in terms of greater regulation than media coming out of other countries. Because, because if the New York Times has an opinion about something that ha and happens to tweet it out in Russian or Chinese, does it face the same test? And, and I, for, for the global platforms, those are the considerations is can I globalize this rule? Well, you, you know that uh, uh, the Chinese government and Russian government do not allow in whatever they don't want their public to see. And I think we have to get over what's fair in our society to recognize these are instruments of power that these governments are using. So if we want to say completely hands off, we're at their mercy. I think that's wrong. I want, to, I want some protection as an American citizen to know at least what I'm looking at, not for those uh, instruments of propaganda not to be uh, hiding so I can't see that they are propaganda and who they're from. That would be a minimum for me. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah, I think you, you would probably, I mean, you'd be just, perfectly justified in saying they're of, uh, a, I mean, if Estonia, which is number one in, 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 uh, in the Freedom House rating of uh, freedom in the media. You guys are number one now? We've been number one all along, ever <laughs> since it started. We're still number one. And China is last. And China, okay. But if, if we decided that we, you know, we have a position on the U.S. election, I mean, you know, we shouldn't be allowed to do it either, right? I mean, that's... Right. I, 
Hard questions. Dennis, do you want to jump in on that? Well, as a general matter, I, I, I think that spending in elections is, so if you just start from whether there should be regulation of uh, money that's invested in elections, I think there should be more than there is. For example, I thought the Supreme Court's decision on Citizens United was uh, an unhelpful right. decision. Right. Fantastic. Flowing from that position, I also think that a foreign power should not be able to spend money in our elections in a completely um, uh, covert way. If that's happening, there's money that's exchanged somewhere along the line that should be recorded at the very least. Right. That, that's what American citizens have to do when they buy public spending. Right. They have to file FEC filings and FEC reports. Surely there's not a lower standard, standard for a foreign power. Uh, I would even be comfortable far, you know, above the baseline requirements of knowing when a foreign power is through one of its own subsidiaries is making such investments. Uh, I'd be also comfortable with identifying those. Again, through the established mechanisms, mechanisms we have, FEC and otherwise. Normally those are ex post facto and they look back right. on the reporting. Um, you know, it's hard to see how you would do it otherwise, but it doesn't strike me as uh, overly controversial. So I got one more question, but maybe I should go to the audience. We've already bled into prescription. What, what, are, what does the audience want to vote? One more question? Okay, uh, Jerry nodded yes, so that gives me permission. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not a democracy He's, yet. I was gonna say he picked this up in Moscow. <laughs> he looked out, looking he for, looked my out for his guy. <laughs> I was looking for my leader. <laughs> Where's my guy? Well, there, he says it's good. <laughs> Well, this is a bit of a provocative question, and, and take, take a shot at it or not, and then we'll go to the audience. But we've been talking about defense and norms about what we should do here. What about a more offensive strategy, uh, which is, of course, very controversial? Uh, and we do it. I don't know if the Estonian government does it. You can tell us, uh, President Ilvis. But of course, we already have instruments uh, that the US government owns and controls to varying degrees to to use information to achieve our foreign policy objectives. Uh, there's some people in the room that have been part of assessing that. I think the, you know, giving out grades again, uh, I don't think we're doing great on that as a former government official. When I looked at what we were doing in Russia, uh, but should we, should we be more joined in this, you know, dare I say, ideological struggle? Uh, there's no doubt in my mind, I know Putin probably better than most in this room. Uh, he thinks of it that way. I mean, he thinks he is in an ideological struggle against the Western liberal order. And, he does not, and he's got a multi-pronged strategy that has everything to do with soldiers to Sputnik to fight that. Um, we, don't, we don't even, it doesn't feel to me like we think in those terms. Should we? And if so, what's the right, what's the right way to frame that? I'll make three points. Number yeah, one. One of them was in your Washington Post article today. Go get it uh, to advertise well, it. Whatever. Yes, yeah. please. I mean, the first point is, which I've been making for ever since last year is that, I mean, this is an asymmetric problem. Uh, asymmet it's an asymmetric war. Uh, we cannot go and play around with their election because they count the votes anyway. We can't go around uh, <laughs> spreading, uh, spreading uh, fake news because if anyone, if someone gets it or someone retweets it, they'll go to jail or they'll be arrested. So I mean, we have, we cannot fight them on this, on these grounds. I mean, liberal democracy cannot use uh, these tools against an authoritarian regime that an authoritarian regime uses against liberal democracy. So, forget it. Then a little hope comes in from the fact, I mean, sort of to take as analogy the, the, I guess, the explicit Department of Defense. Uh, uh, policy when people start thinking about cyber attacks on the infrastructure is that the U.S. government will need not respond in the same domain to an attack in cyber, which I think kind of makes sense. I mean, wh why would you? I mean, if someone takes out your electrical system, you can go bomb them. Well, I think sort of at a, a sort of at a, as an analogy, um, well, what is asymmetric on our part? Visas. 
I mean, we just, you know, right now we have a fairly, I mean, we, in the West, meaning in the EU and the United States, there are about 130 people who are proscribed from entering the West. And this doesn't touch upon their wives, their mistresses, and their daughters. And here I bring the example of Sergei Lavrov, who while denouncing corrupt, di disgusting, liberal Western democracy sense. Putting me on his visa ban list, add that. Right. And, now, <laughs> and putting you. Yes, now uh, add and, your next point. Uh, but putting his daughter into one of the last bastions of enlightenment education, Columbia University, at the same time. Uh, so, you know, we can, I mean, we have to extend it. I mean, broaden the list of people banned. Don't allow people like the guy who did the adoption ban in the Duma, who simultaneously owns, uh, owns to this day, I guess, a $3 million condo in Miami Beach while he's banning. So we should, I mean, our asymmetries, they want to come here. Our asymmetry is that they want to put their money in the West because it's not secure in Russia. Well, apply money laundering. You do not have to get back in the same domain. Finally, I would say in the same domain, uh, neither Estonia, nor, uh, I can say for sure, and from what I understand, US law, hackbacks are not allowed. Um, however, after the hack of uh, some big, big hacks in Germany, uh, the head of the Bundesverfassungsschutz, which is the um, equivalent of the FBI in Germany, said, if you hack our citizens' data, we will go back and get it, and if not, we will fry your servers. Uh, I don't know if that had an effect, but I mean, that's just, uh, that, I mean if, the, if the FBI said that, I mean, you know, I think people would go, whoa. Get, get people's attention, yeah. Nicole? So um, I think you started the question with, like, we don't think of ourselves as on offense. And in my experience, um, representing companies like Google and Twitter in the international sphere and, and representing the United States in that sphere, um, they think we're on the offense, right? Good point. We, the, the headquarters of the most of the largest, most powerful internet companies in the world are here. We have been exporting our technologies, our culture, our movies, our, our music out into their worlds. So they already feel besieged mm -hmm. by American culture and technology and the way things are framed. So I, 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 I'm, just, I'm fighting a little bit with that framework because yep. I think that there is um, important work to do there. And what, would, what is that work in uh, well, 30 seconds or less? I don't know, part, part of it, and so I'm going to invite all of my colleagues who are here from companies to talk about, like, what does it mean to be a global citizen, right? What can you do? And I would say to you, um, which I think was resonated a little bit in the last panel, if you don't build it, you're going to get regulated into it. It is incumbent upon the companies to figure out the right solutions here because the, the panic is real. And, and you know better than anyone how the interfaces will work well. Um, so you've say, got to build this. I would this. add to that as a European, pay your taxes. <laughs> <laughs> or don't relocate to lower tax European havens. <laughs> <laughs> no, the issue is really, no, oh. this is a very, if you make. This is about to be an awesome conversation. If, if you make your money on 83 million Germans, uh, but you pay your taxes, uh, in a, in, in, with a different tax rate with 3.5 million Irish people, um, but your money is made based on all that massive, uh, that volume of Both Germany. countries are in the EU, by the way. No, uh, yeah, but yeah. taxes are paid locally. Yes. And it, it's not, it, that's not going to last. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're, we're singing from the same song sheet here. <laughs> Mike, and then Dennis, uh, final word, and then we'll get to the audience. We're, uh, we're clearly in an ideological war. We won that in the Cold War, but that was 25 years ago. So whether we want to recognize it or not, we're in that. Vladimir Putin, as you said, is waging that. So is General Secretary Xi Jinping. If you read what they're writing, that's how they're approaching it. So for us to act like, well, we're not going to respond to that, I think is naive and dangerous. So we have to use all the tools available to at least put a US-based narrative out there. Because their objective, in my view, is to tear down the world order that's guaranteed global safety since World War II. Oh, it's not US-based. It's not US-based. It's actually liberal democratic. Much more important than simply the US. And it only suits them to say, everyone else, Europe, Japan, Australia, are satrapies of the United States. It is the liberal democratic order. That Better put, I, I completely agree with you. Yeah, I, I associate myself with that.
OK, great. Let's uh, go to the audience. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, go to this gentleman first. And uh, who else wants to get in quickly? Good. Sit off right here for the second one, just to save time. And if, introduce yourself. And if you have a concrete question for a particular person, uh, please do so. Uh, my name is John O'Farrell. I'm almost afraid to ask a question as an Irishman after the previous comments, but I'll, <laughs> I'll do it anyway. Um, uh, I was wondering if, uh, from anybody on the panel, if you think something could be learned from the uh, financial sector here. Uh, Michael, you were asking about the role of government versus the role of companies in regulating themselves. Um, I was thinking about anti-money laundering and the fact that uh, be to combat money laundering, the banks were subjected to know your customer rules where they are legally obliged, and this is in countries around the world, not just the United States, to know their customer um, and to be able to disclose that if required. And I was wondering if you could have a similar regulation applied to the internet providers like Facebook and Twitter, know your content supplier, know your advertiser on, on pain of legal sanction and disclose it. Um, and I would say disclose proactively in this case uh, for, for purposes that we've discussed earlier. Interesting. Comments? I would say yes, that would be a good thing uh, for those companies. But Leonid Bersitsky today in one, I guess, business, one of the business papers actually points out, I think rightly, that, that the biggest effects of what they're doing to us in the West are not it's not on social media. It's through, uh, through money. That I mean, there, it is basically the statistic is that half of Russian money is outside of Russia, and it is getting in through the collusion of governments that love to get this money in. Mo first and foremost, the UK. That's for you, with an Irishman. Uh, <laughs> the Brits are just not looking at where, what's coming in. The U.S. is not doing a better job through the through allowing shell companies to buy real estate. Uh, I mean, all of these high, very expensive apartments are being bought in New York and in Miami by shell companies that really have, are laundering money. So they may not put the money in the bank, uh, in, a U, in a U.S. bank, they'll put it into a, but a shell company in the U.S. will go buy all of this property and is having a disastrous effect on, in the case of the U.K., even sort of the rule of law. Um, so, but so yes, but on, in terms of these tech companies, I think some kind of regulation will be inevitable. Uh, and I think that the way it's going to move, if not here at first, it will be somehow regulating them as utilities in some way that uh, has not been thought of, and b then people will argue back that well, you can't apply utility law from the the turn of the, the, la the previous century, and I say, yeah, well, they didn't have any utility law until then. I think there will be laws that will somehow treat these large companies uh, as utilities one way or another. And the thing is, if that's what the left wants, and in the U.S. that's what Steve Bannon wants, I think there's a tide moving in that direction. So I, I think that um, the know your customer thing is really interesting in, in Clearly important in the financial sector. I think in the information social media sector, some some services are starting to do that because they're trying to keep the comments from being complete trash, right? Um, so you're seeing them impose that on themselves. I do worry about the consequences of authenticating every individual who wants to speak because of something that was mentioned in the last panel, right? We do pe have people who are in danger, right? If not in our country, then in other countries. We do have people who are in domestic violence chat groups who don't want to be um, identified. And I think even, even if you were to say, well, just the company should keep it safe, in my experience working for these companies, um, the government can get to anything, right? If they've got a warrant, they'll get it. And so you, you can't build it and believe that you get to decide when someone gets de-anonymized. Um, and, and I think that's a, something that has to be considered. So right here, next question. Hi, thank you very much, and thank you, panel, this afternoon. Um, my name is Sonia Khan. I am a pediatric critical care trauma doctor, and I am, I've been telling people, I'm the purple unicorn that actually left clinical practice, and I'm now involved in public service and community outreach and um, civic activism, and I'm now the human relations commissioner for the city of Fremont, which is over the bay here. Um, and I was one of, I've been on Twitter since 2009. I am your um, frontline stakeholder who's actually, I claim that we won the vaccine war 
two years ago on Twitter when we passed the repeal of the personal belief exemption uh, here in California. I was I worked with Senator Pan on that, and and uh, you know my job was Twitter. Um, so one of my questions for you is, in terms of looking at information as the weapon. Uh, whether you have any thoughts on the destruction of information as a weapon. So one of the current conversations about uh, is whether or not the POTUS account can delete uh, things from the account. And we know, practically speaking, there's 100 million screenshots of what he said, so it's not relevant, but people are looking at the Presidential Records Act to see whether that applies. And, and, but I want to extend that question all the way to the supposed accidental deletion of the only digital copy of the CIA torture report. And so what, uh, what are the thoughts on uh, protection of information and destruction of it as a tool? And, and the current administration currently trying to wipe the climate change uh, data from the websites and abruptly yesterday actually removing uh, water, running water and food data on the, uh, what's happening in Puerto Rico from their website. This was done yesterday. So I just wondered whether you had any thoughts about that. Just to be clear though, we were talking about foreign threats, but you're actually talking about right. the US government, well, it, right? Yes, it is domestic, okay. but I'm not, and, I, and I'll, I'll <laughs> throw that right out there then and talk about uh, Germany, I, I believe it's Germany, if not the whole EU, and the law that they've just uh, passed about allowing minors to expunge their digital records when they reach age majority. So I think it's, it, it it's applicable everywhere, although what we're, the phenomena yep. we're witnessing okay. most seriously is here in the United States. Thanks very much. Well, I mean, um, so just to pick up this, the last strand of Mike's question uh, and then your question, I, as a general matter, I think we as the United States have generally believed that more information is good information, or, or more information is good. And as a general matter, so I don't, I didn't read, for example, the earlier comments about making sure as liberal democracies we're protecting our space in this ongoing debate with illiberal non-democracies uh, as meaning necessarily that we, we think there, I think there should be less information out there. I think we should flood our ideas and you know, our arguments into the system. So I think that's a fundamentally offensive point. Mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately, I have a perhaps naive belief that you know, the right information will see uh, more light of the day. So, so that's point one. Point, and, and by the way, the platforms which we largely invented and in many ways could only be invented in this ecosystem in this country, I think are manifestations of that. Right. So that's the second point. Third point is. Um, I, uh, I can assure you, by the way, that the, the Senate Intelligence uh, Committee report has been determined to be a presidential record because that's what President Obama did, so it's, it's saved. So I don't, I'm not sure what you're referring to, but that's in the archives, and that is as it is, right? Um, the beauty of the, the reason I brought up the Presidential Records Act and the Federal Records Act is because I think it is a direct response to our most concrete experience in this country of a different view, which is less information being better than more information. And it's now law of the land enforced by uh, criminal statutes, and both of those are criminal statutes, that everything has to be maintained. And so not only does it not really matter what the president or a particular administration thinks. You know, we spent the whole last year of our administration passing you know, 450 million emails to the, United, to the archives of the United States and hundreds of millions more digital records. Those are there for living um, forever. And the same will be true, by the way, I assume, of uh, any digital records associated with at POTUS because we went through that analysis ourselves. So I, uh, I admire what you did on vaccine. You should have that fight in Minnesota too, uh, where it's raging at the moment. But uh, I wouldn't, of a lot of things to be worried about, I, I, I would not put this on the top of your list. I think the legal and infrastructural uh, protections are there. I think you have to it's distinguish between public and private information. I mean, in the European Union, you have a right to be forgotten law. Uh, that applies to most people. It doesn't apply to me because it doesn't apply to public officials. I think the distinction should be that if that if what you're doing is paid for by public funds, it should it <clears throat> you have no right to expunge it. So, uh, I mean that those because those data are public. 
be it a report, be it publicly financed uh, data on climate change or the situation in Puerto Rico. I mean, whether you have to put it up on the web page, but it should be available one way or another. On the other hand, as a private individual, whether you're a minor or even if you're an adult, if you are not involved in the public sphere, then if you don't want to be there, you can expunge yourself, I think. Radhika, yeah. And then back here, Elaine. Radhika Shah, Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs. My question around the earlier theme of foreign powers uh, kind of interfering with the elections. Is there, in terms of the stakeholders, is there a role for the United Nations organizations like the ITU to help st set global standards on, just like there are human rights violation standards for the international community to act on with these kind of developments? Is there a role for standards like that, both in terms of st enforcement as well as mindset change? Absolutely not, unfortunately, given the history of the ITU, the uh, attempts uh, by authoritarian governments uh, over the years. Here, I think uh, Ambassador can talk about it much more, but the ITU was really trying to push through a rather totalitarian model of internet governance, and so it's completely discredited itself in that regard, unfortunately. But that's the way it went, and I don't think anyone's willing to go that route anyway anymore because this kind of the in fact, we even have an organization, the Freedom Online Coalition, uh, which was created to, uh, among inter alia, to, to stop efforts to impose censorship on the web by totalitarian regimes via the ITU. Wasn't the State Department pushing uh, some efforts there for uh, global norms? <laughs> yes. Elaine? So my question, I'm Eleni Kunalakis, former U.S. Ambassador to Hungary, currently running for Lieutenant Governor, and hopefully will end up being in government to deal with some of these things here in California. But my question is very similar, but also kind of specific, and it's for Dennis and for Mike. If you could turn the clock back and be back in the White House and take one issue, one policy that President Obama might have been able to put in place that could have protected against the hacking by the Russians? Or frankly, any piece of all this as you've been noodling and talking about um, the various ways that government could make a difference, what would you want to do? What would you, would, what, what would you have done if you had had that chance? Well, I, I, thankfully I was not in the White House in 2016, <laughs> but I, I'll answer that. But I want to hear what Dennis has to say. It's nice to see you, Ambassador. So thanks for all the good work that you did. Um, you know, I've been through this a lot in my mind, as you might suspect. And I, I, I don't know that there's a silver bullet. So my answer is, I can't think of a silver bullet that uh, we would have been able to launch. Um, and um, I will say that when I talked with uh, Reince Priebus about the transition, I urged him to get independent his own independent technological expertise close to him, much like um, we had, we developed a PIFS and uh, yeah, you know our um, digital uh, U.S. digital service expertise. Because I, in my job, 2016 is just one very small manifestation of an issue that dominated eight years, from Chelsea Manning to. Edward Snowden to OPM hack uh, to any other number of uh, incidents. And um, this goes back to the baseline requirement, I think, for public policymakers have to have a much more, a much broader understanding of the technological piece of United States policy across the board. Um, and the need for all of us. Um, to do some of the things that, uh, that Mike referred to before in terms of both Michaels re had re referred to, namely the hygiene question. So, um, I, you know, I wish, I guess I don't wish I could turn back time. I, I, I'm glad to be done with it. But, <laughs> uh, I, I've racked my brain on that question, Ambassador, and I've not come up with a good answer. So, uh, uh, one of our speakers tonight uh, just published a book, and uh, I just saw it this morning. Uh, that, well, I've seen it before, but I saw this passage. She quotes a tweet I did uh, there. Um, 
Um, and so I've been thinking about that all morning, knowing that Dennis was going to be here, um, talking about what, what, what could have been done, what should have been done. And it's really hard to be comprehensive in a tweet, right? Um, uh, but, but I would say two things, and I don't mean this to be a punt. Like, I think the, the horrible dilemma that Dennis and his colleagues in the White House were in, in terms of what to talk about, when to talk about it, uh, I, I don't, there is not a silver bullet for that, and, I, and that, that I think, it, when, when sometimes it's oversimplified, when I speak about this, not on this panel, I, I always want to remind people, because there was not, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, what I do think we should have some better norms on in a society is to codify what to do in that situation, because you got to remember, at least this, and Dennis, correct me if I'm wrong in any part of how I'm characterizing this. But there's what the White House should have done. But the FBI is not the White House. Uh, there is a reason we do not want those lines to be crossed. Uh, we want that, uh, uh, the FBI to be an independent actor. And for me, it's really not about what could have happened at the White House, where I don't really see an easy solution. But I think codifying the norms, not, and, and maybe by law, by the way, this notion of 60 days out, oh, it's some, it's some norm we have somewhere, you know, it's always been that way. Uh, well, why not, maybe we need to codify that, that it's not just a norm of the FBI, but that it, we have, this is what you do when you detect this is happening, and this is what you don't do. Like, well, let's like nail that down so that we're not uh, relying on the judgment of, of the director. Uh, you know, and I don't know what the answer to that is, but I know from my old job that, uh, you know, I knew lots of things happening with Russians doing all kinds of things that, that you don't know about. Um, and when they affect electoral outcomes, maybe you should. Well, let's codify that uh, and, and so that it's not just a judgment call. The other obvious thing is when you're, you're in that boat, you either talk about all investigations or you don't talk about any, but you most certainly don't talk about one and not the other. I mean, that, that I just think is obvious, and I think that was a huge mistake. What was your tweet? By the book. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, show it, I'll show it to you in the book. I don't want to take any more time. Yeah, I'll come back to you. Yeah, over here. Thank you, Dr. Brad Boyce, military fellow here. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask quickly about deterrence. Uh, yes. It was on my list. I skipped it, so thanks for bringing it up. Is there a way to deter disinformation by foreign powers? Sorry, is there a way to deter disinformation by foreign powers? And if there is, where do you put the red line to transition from deterrence operations to defensive or offensive operations at that point? Well, it sounds like the, the head of the German for Fassungsschutz <laughs> has uh, you know, tried his best hand at deterrence. Um, it's obviously different than, than uh, the United States. Um, but I guess I want to go back to my answer in the last, uh, the last go around, which is on information operations, I think we deal with these all the time and nobody more than you. And I think ultimately, uh, as long as we're staying on offense with our own information operations, I think we're going to crowd the space better than, than the opponents. And notwithstanding, you know, what, uh, uh, President Ilvis was saying before about what we now know, thanks to the, the Senate committee investigation, um, you know, we, we don't know the impact of that on votes. Uh, and in any case, there's still a very robust debate going on around that at the same time. So um, I'm, I'm not sure that there's uh, um, a deterrence outcome in information operations specifically. But I do think that um, we should be um, increasingly clear about our willingness to um, respond when necessary, not necessarily cyber for cyber, but uh, interest for cyber, um, when we're confronted with these challenges. So I think deterrence in cyber generally uh, is something we ought to try to get to, uh, which would be a natural outgrowth of 
more mature and robust discussions around international norms on the use of cyber in, uh, in um, the military context. So I would try to get to it generally in cyber. I'd do it through the ongoing negotiations on norms. I would, don't think it's, it's something we should do specifically around information ops because I don't, I, I don't feel like we're, um, we can be overmatched in information operations. I think when we're going uh, action for action, there's nobody who's going to be better than this uh, than we are. Witness the fact that right now we're having an entire debate around whether we're being outdone on platforms that we created. So, yes, can I ask a follow-up question and for others as well? Um, what about uh, the, the the earlier discussion about uh, multilateral organizations? To you, Radhika, that that got a pretty uh, uh, affirmative no. Um, what about uh, much more modestly bilateral treaties on very narrow issues? So when I think about the nuclear experience, uh, you know, and, and w w before we just had deterrence and we were going up and up and up, and then at a certain phase in our relationship with the Soviets, um, we got to a place where we stopped, you know, so we didn't, we didn't get rid of weapons, but we stopped the growth. But then, every now and then, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of t teetering now, but the INF Treaty got rid of a, a particular kind of weapon. Um, would there be a, t a possibility, and with the Chinese as well, by the way, where you could negotiate, not a big thing, but say, you know, in this treaty, we pledge, and I know the enforcement things are hard, but we would not attack, you know, your electric grid. That, that, and we're gonna sign a treaty and pledge to that and make a credible commitment publicly that, that between these two countries we do not do that? Or are we, is it too, A, is it too early, or would B, that put us, us at a disadvantage? No, I, I, look, I, that's what I mean, that I would arrive to some, some uh, more firm declarative deterrence policy through that process. Got that it, is to it. say, okay. through building some shared understanding of what's in and what's out. And I think you can start that and very narrow questions. Carnegie's just put out an interesting paper, I thought, on, uh, on the financial sector. Um, so you can start it narrow. You can, do, you can build that not only to build confidence, but also to build some common understanding of beginning to establish what's in and what's out. But, but I think there's certain things we already know that are out, which is somebody's going to try to influence the outcome of our democratic processes. That's out. The, uh, I mean, the, the <clears throat> The deter deterrence worked in, uh, with nuclear weapons because both sides knew they had something really to risk. In this case, as I said, it's, I mean, in many of the cases we talk about, it is asymmetric. They don't have that much to risk. I forgot to want mention one thing we could do, and I think we should put it out, that's we in the West, which is, you do this, we turn off SWIFT, which is the, uh, I mean, I... <laughs> You, I mean, the economy will free, freeze up in a day if we're... Uh, you run that by Wall Street yet? <laughs> no, no, we don't turn off our SWIFT. It's just that Russia will be frozen out of SWIFT. Turns out Wall Street's got some stuff in Russia. <laughs> that's my point. Uh, well, you that's, just told us half their money's abroad. Remember no, no, that. Well, yeah. Yeah, but that's, that's... Well, I mean, that's part of the price you pay. And that, and you have, but you have to get to the point where they have something to lose as well that would bring them to yeah. the table. Other things have not worked. I mean, the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime uh, basically uh, is wonderful because all of the countries that actually are worried about cybercrime do uh, accede to it, but the major sources of cybercrime yeah. have not acceded <laughs> to it. And so it's an utterly useless yeah. treaty, or it's only yeah. minorly useless, or it is effective when one of the Russian bad guys goes to Spain and then the Spanish pick them up and send them to the United States. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And so, I mean, if they don't exceed or if they don't buy into the treaty. Yeah. I, I, I tend to think about this problem not in terms of deterrence, and I'm going to get the military terms wrong, probably. not in terms of deterrence, but in terms of resilience. Um, because, partly because I think the structures for doing deterrence aren't really there and effective. Partly because I think it, when you think about how this information war went down in the last election, um, they weaponized us against ourselves, right? And so it, it was American citizens that were participating in the creation of some of this content and the virality of some of this content. It wasn't just the Russians. So the being able to distinguish between um, 
attackers and non-combatants is super hard in this particular field. Uh, and, and for that reason, I think thinking about resilience, thinking about the transparency of how we know where information comes from and who's responsible for it and who's paying for it strikes me as much more powerful than trying to, to figure out a, a deterrent strategy. Well, so, a deterrent yeah, could please. be public shame. We need to get more aggressive on where we can determine what are the sources. We need Good to be point. naming that. So I think if there's no cost, it's, President Novos made this point, yeah. if there's no cost, whether it's in the cyberspace or other, but if no cost, it just keeps happening to us and it gets worse. And that's a job for society and the media, right? I think it's important, like I think um, to, to this point, it was still debated when we left the White House as to whether the Russians did anything around the election. Good point. Right. People have forgotten that. It's not debated anymore, one. That's important. The president, I think, uh, the president that we were working for at the time thought it was important that we establish for the public record exactly what we knew. That has now been affirmed. Right? The intelligence community got it right. That's point one. Point two is, I think the most consequential thing this week on this topic has not been the discoveries of some of the things that have already been mentioned, but the fact that the Republican chairman and the Democratic vice chairman stood before the mics earlier this week, I think it was on Tuesday, and read out where they are on their joint investigation. Uh, something that's being done, Republicans and Democrats, to get to the bottom of the question, right? That's all part of the answer to both things that Nicole and Michael have just said, which is, one, naming that Russia did this is publicly very important. That had an impact in France, France learned some lessons from it, had an impact in Germany. Second is they did weaponize us against ourselves, as Nicole said. And I think Chairman Burr and Vice Chairman Warner standing there together sends a very important signal to the country. I agree. Actually, I published a piece, and I have a column in the Washington Post, and I published a piece in August of 2016 talking about this issue. I've never received more hate mail ever and never received more... Uh, stuff saying you are absolutely crazy to think about this. So that story, if you think about it, it's only been a year, has moved very far. Marcos gets the last question. Oh, wow. uh, okay. It better be a really good question. But <laughs> back to the same theme that, of my questions, you can listen to his question and say, that's a really good question. But here's the more important question. And then we're going to end with our panel no matter what. Well, I'm actually, I'm actually going to reflect on something that you just said. And so if it's not a good enough question, then <laughs> it's, my fault. it's your okay. fault. Perfect. Uh, but it really is when you brought up the question of deterrence and you tried to address it, um, we're still putting it in a framework of state versus non-state actors, right? And so there is nothing, when, when we had nuclear weapons as the question of deterrence, well, that was something only a state could really manage. But we're at a level right now where, as the President of the United States has said, a 400-pound guy sitting on a bed can actually do at least some of this. Um, so it's a question of how do we look at the scale of whatever an attack is to determine whether or not it's something that can be done by a state or not. And that really complicates things more and really brings us back to Nicole's uh, question, or rather response of resilience. And I think that really, if there's one thing that we need to look at as a matter of as a result of this panel, it's how do we achieve that? What do you think? To put it in a question, and then we'll just end there. Yeah, how do we achieve a resilience? <laughs> well, I would just say, first of all, okay, some things are clearly state-run, uh, but even those that are clearly state-run, like the uh, Advanced Persistent Threats 28, 29, Fancy Bear, Cozy Bear, however you call them, I mean, what we are facing is actually somewhat different from a state-to-state -state thing, but it's not state-private. Uh, I would argue that what Russia has done on a broad scale is created unique forms of public-private partnership between the state and criminal gangs. Yeah. Uh, and so this is, I mean, you are fighting, I mean, well, the Spanish you know, prosecutor said it's a mafia state, uh, which we know from WikiLeaks. Uh, but anyway, that's the problem. I mean, and you can, as we found in my own country 10 years ago with the cyber attacks, you can completely disassociate yourself from, from criminal bots by saying, oh, they're just criminal bots, when in fact you know who's paying for the actions of them. And it's not clear at this point whether APT 28 or 29 are, in fact, uh, ad hoc hackers getting paid by the GRU, or they are, in fact, regular employees. In the case of the PLA, we know that they actually had PLA, whatever, you know, I mean, it's 
spaces that were, were, that were hacking. That was cl more clearly uh, state to state. But in the case of Russia, if you see this sort of melding of crime and state, we just have to treat it all, I would say, as state. Final thoughts, everybody else? Well, I completely agree with that. I think you got the whole range uh, at Symantec we saw you know, the, the complete composition of what was out there. And most of it is uh, criminals looking for financial gain. So that you deal with differently and cooperate with law enforcement. But the most dangerous types of threats are the state-sponsored, and then President Elvis is right, uh, the state's employees are moonlighting and can keep the profits, and, and I think you have to treat that as state-sponsored. Dennis, Nicole, Nicole, Dennis? Uh. So if I could solve the resilience problem, I would have a much greater role in the world than I currently do. So I, I don't know what the resilience answer is. I, I, I've been wrestling in my brain with, with two problems because I, I tend to go like, how would a company operationalize something like this? And I, I think there are two things that we need to wrestle with. One is increasing transparency about where the origin and movement of data is. That is extraordinarily important. We see that from, from the Russian thing, but I think that there's a bunch of other examples about knowing that. Um, there's been a lot of talk about like attributing Facebook ads or tweets to Russian accounts, and I honestly don't know how that happens. And I wonder who's supposed to be the authority in attributing state action to what looks like a personal account. What is sort of insidious to me about this last election is um, if you're trying to operationalize a rule around what's good content and bad content, but the account is lying to you about who they are and what their true intentions are, I think that's a really hard problem to solve without squelching the rights of someone who is, in fact, an American citizen um, or, or a citizen of some other country. Uh, and, and so I've been wrestling with that in terms of the results. I think problem. Uh, you're only talking about half of it, because I also don't know what Facebook is selling from my data. And certainly the original That's Cambridge. That's solvable though, right? Like, or well, should all I'm saying is that, okay, I mean, we know now that Cambridge Analytica was buying like data and then now it's not being sold. But I mean, I thought that's unconscionable. Uh, so we need to know both sides of this. Yeah. Not only yeah. I where the, well, I mean, the origin of the data may in fact be the user. But somewhere. the targeting of the data is super important. And I the totally paradox agree. Of, of your, or are you, you don't vote in America. No, I'm so not a my citizen. data, just to be clear, I always get confused with the accent. Uh, 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 so my data being sold to the Russians without me knowing it to influence the outcome of my election. Think about the paradoxes of all that and, and whose property rights are we talking about. But that probably is for a different panel. Uh, looking at the Ambassador Donahoe here. Dennis, you get the last word if you want it. Uh, I just say I learned an interesting fact last year, last week. And when we visited IBM for some other work we're doing at the Markle Foundation, which is that 90% of the extant data in the international ecosystem was created in the last two years. Which, in the last two years. Which, if that's true, then we're on the front end mm -hmm. of a massive question mm -hmm. uh, that relates both to your observation but also to this question, which is ultimately we have to decide how we're treating that data uh, for all the reasons we've talked about. But I'm fundamentally optimistic about this. We've got the best ideas, and uh, now I'm talking about we being Stanford University. <laughs> <laughs> Distinguished fellow at FSI, Dennis McDonough. <laughs> we, we being uh, liberal uh, democracy personnel, we created these information platforms, and we've confronted a lot harder problems in our history of democracy. I'm fundamentally optimistic about this, um, and notwithstanding the debate um, <coughs> that we're having. So I really appreciate being part of it today. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm glad it's a really huge problem just starting, so that's why we <laughs> have the launch today. So that's a perfect <laughs> advertisement for the future for our project. Um, I also am optimistic. I, we, you were, if you were not here earlier, uh, Timothy Garton Ash reminded us of all the virtuous things that have happened, just incredible things that have happened in a positive way. But there most certainly is work to be done to make it even better. And you all have helped us advance that ball today. This has been a fantastic panel. Please help me thank them. <laughs>